empty tomb means we can be freed from sin and death and made alive in Jesus our risen King. As the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Galatians, Christ has set us free to live a free life. So take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. But how do we live into this new life of freedom? How do we resist falling back into slavery? What if we really could experience, here and now, the Holy Spirit's power to be set free? Good morning. Uh, my name is the Reverend Kristen Brower. For some of you, um, I am a familiar face as I was on staff here at Trinity for uh, nine years, uh, serving as the Director of Children and Family Ministries and the Pastor of Young Adults and Community Engagement. Uh, I now serve as the Director of Discipleship at Northwestern College, but I say this every time I get to come and share the word here. Uh, Trinity is just such a, a dear place that uh, encouraged my call, formed my call, gave me space to, to live into uh, my gifts. And so it, it's always uh, a joy and a privilege and an honor to come back and, and preach here. And so uh, it's good to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, as we come to uh, the text, as we come to the sermon, would you pray with me? God, our Father, Jesus, our Savior, Holy Spirit, our guide, uh, we thank you uh, for this word, uh, the words we already spoke, that uh, the word is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. God, words that were written thousands of years ago that still transform us and challenge us and grow us to be more like you. So God, I pray this morning that we are able to find ourselves in the midst of this story, in the midst of the Galatian people. And God, that we are changed and transformed and challenged to leave, to live more transformed into your likeness as people who have been set free. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite uh, Harrison Weeby Faber up. He is going to be reading our passage uh, for us this morning. Uh, that's what happens when you have an office down the hall from me, and you're like, by second service, my voice is not going to be able to handle a whole text. And I said, asked Harrison if he would be willing to read. But just a reminder of uh, where we have been uh, in Galatians. Paul's continually trying to tell the Galatian people, hey, it's Jesus plus nothing, right? Jesus plus nothing. And so here we find ourselves with these Galatian people that Paul is writing to, and these are people he loves. This is a, a church that he has spent time with, a church that he has planted and uh, continually tells them it's Jesus. It's not what the Judaizers and the Jewish authorities um, are saying. And so there's a lot going on in our passage today. Uh, as I spent time in it, I could probably give you an hour sermon, um, which I won't do because I know we have lunch at 1145, or it could be three or four sermons. And so I spared you all of that, and kind of uh, there's four different parts that we're going to be taking a look at in this passage. But uh, Harrison will be reading for us uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 8, through chapter 5, verse 1, from the NRSV. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to beings that by nature are not gods. Now, however, that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and beggarly elemental spirits? How can you want to be enslaved to them again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid that my work for you may have been wasted. Friends, I beg you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong. You know that it was because of a physical infirmity that I first announced the gospel to you. Though my condition put you to the test, you did not scorn or despise me, but welcomed me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What has become of the goodwill you felt? For I testify that, had it been possible, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. 
They want to exclude you so that you may make much of them. It is good to be made much of for a good purpose at all times, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, for whom I am again in the pain of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, I wish I were present with you now and could change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Tell me, you who desire to be subject to the law, will you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. One, the child of the slave, was born according to the flesh. The other, the child of the free woman, was born through the promise. Now this is an allegory. These women are two covenants. One woman, in fact, is Hagar from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the other woman corresponds to the Jerusalem above. She is free and she is our mother. For it is written, rejoice, you childless one, you who bear no children. Burst into song and shout, you who endure no birth pangs. For the children of the desolate woman are more numerous than the children of the one who is married. Now you, my friends, are children of the promise, like Isaac. But just as at that time the child who was born according to the flesh persecuted the child who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Drive out the slave and her child, for the child of the slave will not share the inheritance with the child of the free woman. So then, friends, we are children not of the slave, but of the free woman. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Harrison. I told you, there's a lot there. So we're going to take a look at four different Ps today as we go through this passage. And the first is the word passion. In Galatians chapter four, verses eight through 20, the first section, Paul is pleading with his audience to hold on to Christ alone. Uh, Paul is begging the Galatians to stay firm in the gospel of grace. Paul feels strongly, as I said about the Galatian people, setting aside the gospel that Paul has taught them. He's reminding them once again that pagan, they were once pagans and then disciples of Jesus, and now they're turning back to Judaism. In verses eight through 11, God, he's saying, God is your father. Like you are now in relationship with him. Don't add a legal code of the Old Testament. You don't need to. They were observing features of Judaism that were rooted in the Old Testament. Uh, the Galatians were in danger of being enslaved to all of that again. So it made Paul passioned because they had not understood the message of grace he had proclaimed to them. Maybe he's a little frustrated as well, and so Paul is passionately trying to convince them that the Judaizers' goal is to draw, not draw them closer to God, but draw them farther from God. That the Judaizers aren't inviting them into the fullness or wholeness or even righteousness of God but rather they are trying to alienate them from Paul, to, to drive a wedge between the church and Paul so that the church might turn its attention to them, to the Judaizers, the Jewish authorities. And so it's a, a distraction tactic. They are zealously courting the Galatians. And so Paul passionately labors over them again to try and remind them that Christ might be formed in them. See, if the, if the Judaizers can, can cause the church to second guess Paul, they might second guess the gospel that Paul preaches and that Paul is bringing them. And if they second guess the gospel, they might second guess Jesus himself which if they second guess Jesus, they're gonna be open to rituals and open to rules and open to those regulations. In terms of tactics and strategies to distract, it's actually quite brilliant. They're sowing doubt and mistrust into the Galatian people. 
And I don't know how the Galatian people were receiving this message, but Paul then decides to tell a story. He then decides to tell this allegory. So we get to our second P, which is picture. Picture. Some of the people in Galatia wanted to follow Judaism even after the law of Christ was in effect. And Paul, in his brilliance, or maybe taking uh, a note out of Jesus' teaching, he asks them a question. He says, you want to be under the authority of the law? Tell me something. Don't you know what the law says? And so the Galatian church desires to be under the law, which conflicts with the teachings of the law. So Paul then proceeds to explain the real meaning of the law with two covenants. And Paul uses an allegory to help the Galatians to understand. An allegory is a literary device used to tell stories on two levels, the literal and the figurative. The literal is the plot and the characters and the setting, and the figurative level is what these elements represent. So the plot, It's the story of two women found in Genesis 16 and 21. Paul uses these two women and their story as an allegory, Hagar and Sarah. Paul tells the story of Abraham and Sarah to give the Galatians a picture of how the Old Testament law is superior to, is not superior to the life that Christ offers through faith. Just a reminder of the story, God came to Abraham and he promised him a child in their old age. And Abraham and Sarah waited and waited and waited and waited for God to fulfill the promise. And I wonder if the longer they waited, the the more they doubted God. I wonder if the longer they waited, they began to be like, did we really hear God right that we were gonna have a child? The longer they waited, I wonder if it made them forget the promises that God made to them long before. I don't know about you, but I can relate to this. I think oftentimes in constant seasons of waiting or things to change, it's really easy for doubt to creep in. It's really easy to believe lies. It's really easy to tell ourselves that God is holding out on us. And maybe, like Abraham and Sarah, we take matters into our own hands. Abraham and Sarah then began operating in the flesh instead of in faith. They were operating in faith in themselves rather than faith in God. Instead of waiting for what God promised them, they did what their hearts and their minds wanted to do. They did things their way in their time. They were trusting in their own works rather than in God and his grace, which is legalism. And so Ishmael was born of Hagar, and Ishmael represents a trust in human performance. Ishmael represents a trust in human works. Ishmael represents self-reliance and control and what I can do for myself. In essence, Abraham and Sarah are saying, we can fix the problem. We can save ourselves. We're going to get this done on our own. God, you took too long. I'm just going to take care of this myself. But it's not just a lack of trust in God through the birth of Ishmael. I think Ishmael also brought bitterness and resentment and jealousy. I think that happens to us too when we take things into our own hands and do it by the flesh instead of by faith. Bitterness and resentment and jealousy can begin to take root. So what seemed like a good idea to Abraham and Sarah actually resulted in anger and harshness and conflict and fear. 
Along with, with Hagar and, and Ishmael, we also see this comparison of Mount Sinai and Jerusalem and the Old Covenant. The, the imagery here is God gave the law to Moses at Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and Jerusalem has the temple, which is the center of Jewish religion. Very law-focused things. Hagar is Mount Sinai, representing Jerusalem, the center of law, of Moses, and the temple. And those under the law are under bondage to it. In Arabia, where Hagar and Ishmael went to dwell, the territory near Mount Sinai, she was in bondage with her children. Hagar, a servant or a slave, bore children that passed the slavery that passed the servantness on to the children. And so Jerusalem and all those who follow Judaism are in bondage to the law. A legalistic covenant from Hagar, which produces legalistic children, which produces legalistic fruit, if legalism is even able to produce fruit. Where we have Sarah, who produces free children, to a free covenant and produces free fruit. How people have tried to keep all the rules to earn their way to God, it leads to nothing but bondage and slavery. And Paul is challenging the Galatian people to realize that these false teachers, they, they don't have anything to offer and Paul's trying to show them a better way a more heavenly way. And so Paul makes this connection of that for the purposes of the allegory that Hagar's experience is the law. It was legalistic law keeping, which leads to wilderness and wandering and slavery and to a disconnection both from God and others. So Paul is challenging the Galatian people to, to realize the false teachers and show them a better way, a heavenly Jerusalem. And this is Sarah. Sarah is the heavenly Jerusalem that is above, that's spiritual. It's a symbol of the church. It's free in comparison to bondage. The church, as it said in the passage, is the mother of all believers, through Jesus, the church is adopted into the family of God through Isaac. So this is the, the flip of Hagar is Sarah. It's living into the promise that God had given. It's freedom that comes with living into that promise, which is our third P, promise. If Hagar is law-keeping, Sarah is faith alone in Christ. And Isaac is the way of faith and God's imputed righteousness. Isaac is grace. God blessed Abraham and Sarah and her son. God kept his promises. Regardless of Abraham and Sarah's flesh and faithlessness, God didn't renege his promise. God was faithful. Isaac was a child of the promise, regardless. The blessing was done based on God keeping his word. God is offering that to the Galatians as well, not by works or by the law. And so we need to look at Isaac as a symbol of our spiritual state. We are children of God's promise. Living like a slave to rule following will harm our spiritual maturity and our relationship with God. Paul goes on to talk about is Ishmael persecuting Isaac. It says, the one born of flesh, Ishmael, mocked the prospects of Isaac and his spiritual destiny. Ishmael was older, but he was not the child of the promise. And so Paul points out this parallel between Hagar's son Ishmael persecuting Isaac and the competing Jewish authorities persecuting Paul. The Jewish authorities are teaching the Galatians to become Jews, to follow the law, because that's how they think they gain righteousness from God. 
This is the human, earthly way to try and control God. I think we do this too often, maybe without realizing it. We're like, well, if I read my Bible every day and I pray every day and I don't sin and I do all the right things, then maybe God will give me what I want. Right, we, we in our own ways maybe try in our productivity and activity to control God. Like Abraham giving himself an heir from Hagar. Isaac, the son of the promise, the, the true heir though is the symbol for us as believers. I'm also sure that the Judaizers thought that they were the elite and the true children of Abraham. I'm sure the Judaizers were like, those Gentiles, they're immature Christians who don't keep the law. They don't do all the right things. And so the Jewish authorities were reteaching that the law was the pathway, not the pathway to freedom. The Jewish authorities were trying to distract them from the true pathway to freedom. And so Paul gives the Galatians this beautiful solution. He tells the Galatians to stop their persecution from Jewish authorities like Abraham dealt with Ishmael. Paul exhorts that Galatian, the Galatians terminate their relationship with the complete, competing Jewish authorities. Sarah demanded they cast out Hagar and Ishmael. He would not be the heir. Isaac was to be the heir. The inheritance was to go to Isaac, not Ishmael. The old covenant was to be cast out. The old cast away. The new covenant remains after the old is done away. And all of Paul's illustrations in this allegory point to believers as free people, inheritors of God's promise, not slaves. Inheritors of God's promise to live in freedom, but not as slaves. This idea to follow the law to please God doesn't work. It's actually the opposite of the resurrection life of Christ. As we celebrate on this side of Easter, we live as resurrection people. We live as free people. When we follow the law, we forget the resurrection of Christ and, and it, we live in slavery. There's no reward in following the law, not in the future kingdom of Christ, nor in the present life on earth. There is only, that's only an illusion of righteousness. We are children of freedom. We serve God out of love for him. Paul concludes his argument by pointing out the promise. He says, you are in Christ, who aren't trying to do things your own way and keep the law. You are children of the promise. You are children of grace. Don't go back to the chains. Don't go back to Egypt. This is your identity if you are in Christ. Which brings us to our fourth P, purpose. Paul gives this question. He has passion for the people of Galatians. Galatia, he gives them a picture, an allegory, and then he finishes the section of scripture with the Galatians' purpose. For freedom, Christ has set us free. The children of the promise are free. Christ has set you free. At the end of Galatians chapter five, he's, God says, do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. A yoke is hung over the necks of oxen and they are big and they are heavy. So picture with me for a second, the, the yoke being the law. This performance mentality on our shoulders pulling us down by its weight. That is what's trying to, to proving ourselves to God, proving ourselves to others, or maybe proving ourselves to ourselves does. It, it takes, it pulls us down into the weight. And the spirit here in the passage says, don't submit any longer. You're free. 
This is not your identity, not activity or productivity. Trying to do what we thought God wanted to do in our own strength, similar to Abraham and Sarah. Trying to do things to earn favor. This was a path away from freedom. And this is something I I personally continually surrender to God. Being an athlete my whole life, I realized a few years ago that I learned quite early on in my early stages of faith formation in life, I learned how to perform to have people like me. Right, for those of you who have competed or performed, when you win, you get praise, and you get praise when you lose too, but you can definitely tell the difference between praise when you win versus praise when you lose. And so I learned how to perform to gain approval. As I was processing this sermon though, I realized we live in a performance culture. It's not just athletics. You post something on social media, people like it, repost it. Your children to do something well, maybe you praise them. You turn in a paper or an assignment, you receive a grade. You do something well, you gain approval. We live in a culture that we perform to have approval often, and what I didn't realize until about 10 years ago was that's the way I operated with God. I did things I performed to have God love me. And so I read my, did the checklist, right? The legalistic checklist of things to be able to perform thinking that that would have God love me. But when I started spending time in the presence of Jesus just to be with Jesus, It changed me. When I took rest and Sabbath just to enjoy God, it changes us. When we abide with our friend Jesus every day and intentionally seek time with him to not do anything for him, it changes us. When I read the Bible because I want to and not out of a feel of I have to, it changes how we intake it. When I pray out of wanting to speak to my heavenly Father rather than just I'm supposed to do this today, it changes how we relate to God. Because God allows us and wants us to live in freedom with him. So I I challenge us this morning that we need to resist the fake of alternatives. So I ask us, what what is your yoke? What are the things that you have? We're not tempted here this morning, like in Galatia, to, to circumcise all of the adult males, but we are enslaved to other things. There are many ways in which our flesh can't wait to take shortcuts like Abraham and Sarah. There are ways that we distance ourselves from our faith in God and put more stake in ourselves or alternative paths. We can find our identity and life in God's gifts rather than in him. We can find our identity and life in God's gifts rather than in him. So I ask us, what, what do we focus on more? What do you focus on more than you focus on God? What enslaves you? What controls you? What consumes you? What distracts you from the freedom Christ offers you? What's distracting you from living into the freedom with all of who you are and all of who God has designed you to be? In Galatians chapter five, it says stand firm, but what are we standing on? Are we standing on obtaining material goods for happiness? Are we standing on our own pursuit of pleasure? 
Are we standing on our own behavior for happiness? Are we standing on a need for safety or control for happiness? Are we standing on the people that we surround ourselves with or our social media presence? Are you having your worth found standing on what other people think of you that you're seeking so hard after their approval and you want people to see how great you are? Are we just using these things to prove ourselves and that we deserve to have a place that we measure up? That we do whatever we can not to miss out on things, but in the process we give our lives to false gods and false idols, which is slavery. And so Paul here reminds us, as he reminds the people of Galatia where true freedom is found. It's when we trust God's grace, when we turn from our own effort, when we open up our empty hands and trust the Lord to fill them. Trying to measure up when the standard is so far beyond us means we will never keep up, and that's slavery. It's like being in Egypt and making bricks without straw. It's miserable because it's impossible. So as we come to the table this morning, let me remind you of this. This is a table that invites and proclaims and is freedom. Jesus saves us by his blood. That was his payment, and he made the payment so that we would stay, not stay in slavery, but walk in freedom. We have been freed how about we start acting like it? Back in, in Christ's day, when people would go to jail, they would end up as, as slaves or servants to people in order to pay off their debt. Imagine a friend showing up at the jail with the funds to get you out of the situation, and you say, nah, I'm good, and telling them to leave. We wouldn't think of that. We would be like, thank you, and we would run with joy. But I think so often we operate as, no, I'm good, I'm just going to stay in here. We run back to Egypt because it's what we know. We run back to the rule-keeping because it's comfortable. We run back to the pleasing because that's where we find our identity. But what we forget is this dishonors Christ and what he came to do. It discredits what we remember at this table. So we, we come together to the table this morning. The, the Lord's Supper is a table both of liberty and of union. Liberty as a reminder that we have been set free from our sin and our death and from hell. And we are free from the burden of earning God's acceptance. We are free from the burden of earning God's acceptance. And we have been set free for a life in the spirit of joy, of holiness, and love. And we have been set free together. There is unity and there is liberty in Christ. And so we come to the table today as a reminder of the freedom that we have being set free in Christ and the union that we have as body of believers to do it together. We call this communion because in the table we, we draw near to, not away from, our freedom. We draw near to Christ. We draw near to each other. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the identity that comes as being free people. God, we know we live in a world and in a culture where it's so easy to make checklists and to perform and to do things to have you love us and see us and care for us. But God, we thank you that you are not a God that does that. You are a God who has open hands that just desires us to trust. 
God, forgive us of those times when, when we too find ourselves living in the flesh and in our faith in ourselves rather than faith in you. God, we hand that to you today and we receive what you give us from this table. God, we receive hope and we receive communion and we receive freedom. We receive grace that comes from you as a father who loves us and sees us and knows us and just wants us to be free in you. So God, we thank you We thank you for this gift of this table. We thank you for the gift of freedom through your son, Jesus. Help us to be people who live free of children of the promise. In your name we pray, amen.